Come on, let's give it up for Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys. Love you guys so much. You can go ahead and take your seats. I'm so grateful to be in this church. I'm so grateful that this is my church family. I feel like I got a life hack. I'm like, it's my church, and I, I don't know. I just feel bad for everybody else who's not here. <laughs> Corrections, uh, family, we love you so much. So grateful that you, you're joining us. Also, if you're new with us on YouTube, we love you as well. Just want to take a moment and honor our pastors. Are you grateful for our pastors? They say everything from the top flows down. And we're all good looking. <laughs> Must come from somewhere. Did you guys coordinate? You guys looking good. You take, your, take your Christmas photos today. Uh, but I'm so excited to be bringing God's word. Uh, it's always such a great honor. And I think it's weird a lot of the times too, because I've just always been the behind the scenes guy. And uh, God's done a big work in my life. And I think when I get these opportunities, I, I simply just want to give away uh, things that God's shown me. Just want to give away my relationship with God with you. And if you want to grab your notes, you can grab some. I'm, I got a lot of notes today. As pastor says, I got more sermon than time. And I would just ask that you would help me preach this. Can y'all help me preach this? Not because we are talk back church, cause, it's because I'm insecure <laughs> and I need it. <laughs> All right. Amen. All right. So today we find ourselves in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. It says this. It says, he is the appropriation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. Good morning. And the truth is not in him. Everybody say, in me. In me. But whoever keeps his word in him, everybody say, in me. in me. Truly, the love of God is perfected. By this, we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way which he walked. Amen. Which he walked. Today's title is... A word on the word. A word on the word. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you are the word made flesh and, and that you have shown yourself true. God, I pray that you would uh, reveal to us, would you enlighten us, would we leave here knowing you more than when we came in. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said a big old amen. Amen, amen and amen. Amen. You know, we're, we're, we're living in interesting times. Unprecedented times, might I say. Uh, you, you can turn on the TV, you can open up a social media app, and it's just, whoa, it's just in your face. Like, your, your favorite fitness influencer, now, now you care about their opinion on something that has to, nothing to do with right. fitness. You know, like, uh, but, but honestly, what, what, what's crazy about the times we live in is, I believe as Christians, it's caused us to actually have a problem, and the problem is with the world. That we think the world out there is our problem, and and the Bible says, for God so loved the world. How did we arrive to a place where we, we have a problem with the very thing that God loves? You know, we like to say here at, that Las Vegas is not a problem to be solved, but they are a people to love. And I believe the Holy Spirit really dropped this, that, that the problem isn't the world out there. I believe the problem is that we just don't have the word in here. That that's the problem. Sorry, you came to church and you're I, I, straight up, eight, 9 o'clock in the morning, you're a liar. But John, John, would, John, honestly, when you see his writings, he's writing this at the end of his life. So that's why he's very black and white. He's like, yo, I got no time, no waste. I'm going to give it to you straight. Thank you, John. I need it straight. I don't need the fluff. You know, we find in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's good. That's good. Notice that it says the, the word of God is living and active, yep. but the purpose of it being living and active to even begin with is so that it gets in you. Yeah. Yeah. That we must get the word of God in us. That, that the Bible like right there, has nothing, it, it, it can't help me. Yeah. But I got to get the word of God in me. And the Bible comes alive when it gets in us. You know, I don't know if you've heard this before, but if you read your Bible, it has a tendency to actually read you. You begin to read it, and you're like, whoa, I don't, how did that even, I, I didn't, how did, I, coincidental, I don't think so. I love James Merritt. He's a pastor. He says, the primary purpose of reading the Bible is not to know the Bible, but it's to know God. 
But that is why we invest in scripture. That's why we take the time. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we come to church. Literally, one of our values is that you would know God personally for yourself. But I understand the struggle. A lot of it is new. It's not like your normal literature. You open it up, and you're like, why is there colons, numbers, two paragraphs of text on one? It's a lot, but I believe today's talk is going to help you so much. And, and so three things on how to get the word of God in you, and I really hope you take notes. Number one, you must trust it all. You must trust it all. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, all scripture, everybody say all scripture, is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped, you and I, for every good work. You have to trust it all. Now, I, I'll say this you don't have to understand it all in order to trust it all. I would even be so bold to say that you'll never understand it all. We'll never understand this all, but you could trust it all. You know why I know you can do that? Because you don't have to, when you turn on a light, you, you don't trust, I mean, you trust that the light's just going to turn on. You're not like, okay, the electric, electric magnetic waves are going to be sent to that light and I'm going to figure this out. No. You know, when you turn on your car, you don't really know how it actually works. You just know that it's going to work, right? Some of y'all prayed in, in tongues for your car to start, but, but you don't have to understand it to trust it all. Uh, Pro, Proverbs 35 says, every word of God Every word of God proves true, and he's a shield who takes refuge in him. Maybe you're just, you're sitting in this room, maybe you're watching or listening to this podcast, and you're like, how, Sway? You don't got the answer, Sway. I really, I think, I'm going to get so practical for this first point, okay? Um, there's, this, there's this thing called apologetics, and it's essentially the, the discipline of defending your faith or defending your theology. And I'm not like a super apologetic. I'm, I'm an apologetic guy, as in I'll say sorry to you if I wrong you, but, but I'm not like one if you come at me and you're like, yo, what about this, this, and I'm like, yo, I don't know. I just love God. He's changed my life. I'm sorry, but I want to give you some handles. Uh, one reason you could trust all of the Bible, number one, is that it's historically accurate. For someone who would say these stories are made up, uh, you know, uh, for, for something to be historically accurate, it has to go through three tests. The first test is eyewitness accounts. Most of the Bible is actually written by people who were actually there. That's, right. That's what we read in the Gospels. It's, a, yeah. it's an eyewitness account. That, that it's recorded and copied with extreme care. Yeah. The Jewish scribes had a standard that no one else had back in the day. And when they, when they uh, created the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, they, they did it letter by letter. So, so they would find the middle letter of, of the, the, the books, and then they would, they would go count in each direction the same way. And if it was off... They threw it out. And so that's why the canonization of Scripture, where we landed on what is the Bible, nothing that could be taken away or then could be added, was done with a very, uh, you know, intense process. For someone who said, no, nah, man, it's always changing. It's, it's changing in the process. And that, that's not true. Because in the 1940s and the 1950s, re literally just decades ago, we found what are called the Dead Sea Scrolls, the original manuscripts. And they were perfect in every way. Yeah. Yeah. It's historically accurate. Another one is that there is archaeological confirmation. And you can go and see these places that we read about in scripture. My friend Sean just went a couple weeks ago to Israel and he was able to see things like where Peter lived. He was able to see places where Jesus preached. Yeah. Archaeologically confirmed. Jerusalem is built like uh, on each other like in layers. And so every day they're unraveling and they're finding things. In 2009 they found where Mary lived. Archaeologically confirmed. Another one is that it's prophetically accurate. Yeah. There are more than a thousand prophecies in Scripture, and over 300 of them are for Jesus alone. And the last prophecy given before Jesus was 400 years before Jesus lived. Wow. That, that's not accidental, friend. Yeah. And, and these prophecies weren't general. They were very specific. They were like where he's going to be born, where he'll find himself, and where he'll live, what animal he's going to ride in on. I don't know if Jesus was like, all right, let me read back. The... <laughs> and even David, even David prophesied the crucifixion before there was crucifixions. You know, uh, th this poses a huge probability. There was actually a study done by this guy named Peter Stoner, Mr. Stoner. 
It's called Science Speaks, and he did, uh, he does the, he, um, he's a guy in, about the study of probability, and he had 600 probability experts study and arrive to what is the probability that one person can fulfill these prophecies. Wow. They couldn't land on a number. Wow. They actually found out that one person fulfilling just eight, remember that Jesus fulfilled 300. Right. One person fulfilling eight, the number is one in 10 to the 17th power. This is the number. That's the number of the probability of one person fulfilling eight of them. Jesus filled 300. You could trust it all. And if you just want a picture, a picture of this would be like if you took a silver dollar for every number in that number, it would fill the state of Texas two feet deep. And then you would take one of those silver coins and mark it, throw it in there, blind yourself, fly over it, and try to find that, and then just, just maybe, maybe you'll get it. No, you won't. <laughs> maybe because it's impossible. Yeah, right. Second Peter 1 says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Maybe because it wasn't men, maybe because there's one author. You know, what's the probability that every time you come to church, you feel like you get a, a word from God? Yeah, yeah. That's, I'm not looking in your DMs. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Pastor, he's not looking at your text messages. I actually think it takes more faith to believe that the prophecies are, are a coincidence yeah, yeah. than to believe that God planned them. That's right. yeah. so good. Good. Another reason that you could trust all of the scripture is that it's thematically consistent. That there's about 40 writers across 66 books spread over a, a, a 1,600 period of time. How did they come up all with the same story? How did they all point to one person? Because there's probably just one author. And also, Jesus trusts the Bible. You know, if you're, if you're someone here that, like, loves Jesus, but I don't know about the word. I, I just, I, I love Jesus, and I, you know, but I don't know about this thing. He actually refers to the Old Testament about 180 times in the New Testament. Right. Jesus trusted the Bible. And then this is my favorite one. The first, the, the, this is one reason you could trust the Bible, is that it has survived all attacks. There's been a target, a target on this book. It's been the most despised, denied, disputed, deconstructed, debated, outlawed, and destroyed book. But it's still here. Come on, somebody. Why was it even attacked to begin with? Maybe because the enemy doesn't want us to know what, about God. No, maybe the enemy doesn't want us to, to have a relationship with God. You know, there's this guy named William Tyndale. Maybe, maybe you have a Bible and it actually says Tyndale in the back or you've bought a, a, a book before. William Tyndale, he was, he was responsible for translating the Bible into English. So this man, you know, the reason, if you read an English Bible, I know a lot of Hispanics got your S, S Bible or what is it? Uh, but specifically, <laughs> dang it, sorry, Fernando. <laughs> but, but we get this because of William Tyndale, and, and he dedicated his life to translating this Bible in English. And here's the crazy thing. William Tyndale was convicted of heresy, and he was strangled to death and then burned at the stake. Wow. And yet we let this thing rack up dust. And yet we let the sun curl the, the page back. And... But he believed in discipleship. And so he raised up people around him. And, and like, I, like Pastor Dan Leanne taught, he, he knew that he wanted to create a legacy yeah. where that when his life ended, that his life would move on even though it would end. But how is that possible? How do we still have this even though it's been attacked? Maybe because Isaiah 48 says, the grass withers. The flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. It says it in the word. I don't know. Maybe you could trust it all. Augustine says this, if you believe what you like in the gospel and reject what you don't like, it's not the gospel you believe, but yourself. You could trust it all. Omar says, if I disagree with it, I'm probably the one that needs to change. But I say all this to say that you can trust this thing. You, you can build your life on the Bible. And something that Pastor Jabin or I can't do for you is actually make you value it. 
that's something you have to come to to yourself. You know, Paul would write this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, but whatever gain I have had, I counted a loss for the sake of Christ. And notice how he puts the value. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. That, that he had a, a supernatural exceeding value for, for knowing who Jesus is. I, I value this thing at the highest level because without it, I'm nothing. You know, um, it's, we were raised, or I mean, maybe some of you here were raised or maybe believe and because, because of Hollywood and movies and our parents, but we were raised to believe that time is money. Time is money, y'all. Like, yeah, come on, come on, come on, time is money. But that's not true. Because if I had a million dollars and I say, who wants this million dollars, all you guys would want the million dollars, right? Yeah. Right, I hope so. But if I said, if you take the million dollars but you have to die tomorrow, would you take the million dollars? No, because time is more valuable than money. Now, this is going to shake people up, but if I had a million dollars to give you, and I said, if you, you free million dollars, but if you take this million dollars, you could never read, hear, surround yourself with God's word. Would you take that million dollars? I hope not. Because these are the words of life. You take this, you take my life. And there's nothing that can exceed the value of having access to the word of God. You could trust it all. Amen. Amen. Number two, consume it daily. Consume it daily. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, and so that you may be careful to do according what uh, is written in all of it. And for, for then you will know, for then you will make your way prosperous and then have good success. Amen. That's the Bible. Yeah, that's right. That the, the result... Of, of, of meditating on this day and night is that we would have good success and be yeah. prosperous. Yeah. Okay. You could take that for however way you want to do it. I, I see that. I'm like, okay, that's relationally, that's financially, that's in health, that's in yeah, right. 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 prosperous and good success. And, you know, there's this, this quote. It says, what consumes your mind controls your life. That's right. that's good. We got to get this word consuming our mind. Yeah. It's got to be the thing that we just think about and ponder about. You know, uh, December has a very special place in my heart because in 2011, I got radically saved. Jesus grabbed a hold of my life, and, and this is like the season. So every time December comes around, I'm like, oh, here is, uh, what is that? I can't do math. Is that like 11 years? Amen. <laughs> but I remember when I first got saved, and I would come to like prayer meetings, and then there'd be people on the mic just praying and go after it, and they're just like reciting scripture off the top of their brain. You got pastors preaching without even a Bible open, and they're just pulling up scriptures, and I'm like, dang, man, I want that. I want, I want, to, I want to be able to, to, to pray God's word and, and speak God's word and recite God's word off a of memory. But I was just new, and I was just like, I, I don't know. I just, I have the desire. And I find a lot of us in this room, I, you know, knowing a lot of you, that you have this desire as well. I would call it a hunger, that you have this hunger. But here's the crazy thing about hunger. Hunger in the, in the natural and hunger in the spirit are different. Because yeah, right. when you're hungry in the natural, your stomach tells you, yo, I'm hungry. Like, and if you don't feed it, your, your stomach growls louder and louder and louder. But in the spirit, if you don't feed that hunger, it actually gets quieter and quieter and quieter. But when you begin to feed on God's word and get God's word in you, you actually build even more of a hunger for God's word. And you're like, I just can't, I just need it. I, someone, I need to get it in me. So don't let, don't let the hunger die down. Feed the hunger. And, and honestly, you know, you know who you're looking at? No, you're not looking at Drake. No, I'm just kidding. You're literally looking at Someone who for the last 11 years would just spend 15 minutes a day with God. You know, sometimes it goes long. Sometimes I get nothing out of it. But just 15 minutes. I love what Pastor teaches us. He teaches us quality, not quantity. I'm not asking you to read the Bible eight hours a day. I'm asking you to, to take some time, to start your day with it. The Bible must be heard, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And if, and if you come to church to hear God's word, that's awesome. But how are you hearing God's word Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? You got to hear it for yourself. You got to read it for yourself. Right. Revelations 1.3, blessed is he who, uh, 
uh, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, devote yourself. Make it your one goal to the public reading of Scripture, to teaching, to preaching. So whatever you can do to consume God's Word, whatever you got to do, you can listen to it, you, you, you should read it, you can study it, you can meditate on it, just get the Word in you. And I want to encourage you, when, when you do read, just, just take a moment, pray and invite the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. You are welcome. Teach me something I don't know. Convict me of something I have wrong thinking in. Because God, we don't serve the spirit of confusion. No, we, we serve, a, a God is a God of clarity. And so when confuse, confusing thoughts come in, you know, you, you, you always just take it to the Holy Spirit, lead me and guide me. The Bible says that he will lead you and guide you into all truth. I actually found when I first started reading scripture and I was just getting confused, I just had the wrong version. Your boy was reading like, Hogwarts, Harry Potter edition. And I was like, I just don't understand it. So getting, getting a version that you uh, understand, and there's the NLT, the NLT Bible. And I'm sorry, uh, Home Goods is actually closed today, so you can't go today, but you can go tomorrow. Okay, also Chick-fil-A, Hobby Lobby, Home Goods. Home Goods is open. They don't got Bibles, though. You guys can tell I don't go shopping with my wife. I'm like, go, babe. But NLT, NIV, these are good versions to read, very easy to understand. And so here's what I'll do tomorrow. I'm just going to give it to you straight. Monday mornings are going to roll around. Actually, tonight, I'm going to prepare for Monday morning. So I'm going to put my Bible somewhere I know I can grab it. I'm not going to, be, not going to wake up and, you know, where is it? But I also charge my phone outside of my room. I just don't want to, if, if my phone is the first thing I grab, usually I'm not grabbing this. So I charge my phone in the kitchen, actually, because... That's what high-level people do. I'm trying to be high-level like everybody. <laughs> what? You don't make your bed? You're not going to be a millionaire. What? What are we even? <laughs> but I, I charge my phone. And so the first thing I do when I wake up, I make a cup of coffee. Amen. Single origin African bean yes. roasted coffee. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and then I'm going to put on some William Augusto. If you like the keys, when, you know when we're, you know, the service ends and you just the keys? What, isn't that, wouldn't it be cool to read to that kind of music? William Augusto. Write him down. He'll change your life. So now I got it ready to go. I'm then going to open the God's word. And I'm going to go to the proverb of the day. There's 31 proverbs. So today is the, third, uh, the fourth. And I'm going to go to Proverbs 4. And I'm, and I'm going to read Proverbs 4 going to take me three to seven minutes. Right. Yeah. Then tomorrow, I'm going to go to Ephesians 1 and 2. I'm going to read Ephesians 1 and 2. That should take me another five minutes. It'll be 15 minutes. I met with God, and I go on throughout my day. Yeah, so that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Hope you can join me. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So we're going to trust it all, consume it daily. Number three, as the keys come up, never let it go. Yeah. Never let it go. Speaking of Proverbs of the day, Proverbs 4, got this this morning, and I was like, oh, got to throw it in. Sorry, Carlos. <laughs> Proverbs 4.4, 4, it says, then he taught me, and he said to me, take hold of my words with all your heart, keep my commandments, and you will live. Yes. Wow. That's what I got today. Amen. It's enough. Like, and that's the cool thing about reading the Bible. If, like, if it really speaks to you, just meditate on that. Be like, dang, I'm going to underline it. I'm going to highlight it. I'm going to pray it, and you're going to get it in you. Yeah. You know, in Matthew 13, there's this parable of the sower that Jesus talks about and essentially that, you know, that the, when the seed goes out and the seed being the word, when the word goes out, it falls on four kinds of soil. The first soil is like the road and, and that's where like the enemy or the, the birds will come snatch it regardless of whatever, you know, like it'll just snatch it. So I, don't, I won't blame you for that one. But then they have, they have thorn, thorny soil where, where the issues of life and the worries of life will choke up the word. And so you get the word in you, but as it's trying to produce something, because you're more concerned about something else, it'll be choked out. And then we have rocky soil, which is just essentially just not a willingness to, to receive. And it kind of like, I would call it a calloused heart. You just, you just can't, it, it just can't get to you. But then the fourth soil, the fourth soil is, 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 is good soil, what he calls. Good soil, what's good soil? I think good soil is just soil that's ready to receive. A, a yielding, a, a waiting, a lean in, a, a ready. Right. Yes. 
to receive what, what's going to be coming. James 1, 2, 2, it says, don't just mi li merely listen to the word. And so, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. You know, once you trust it all, you'll begin to understand it. But understanding the Bible doesn't come by just reading it. It comes from obeying it. I love what John Bevere says. He says, spiritual maturity is not measured by time. It's measured by obedience. Obedience is simply proof of our love for God. And you know, there's kind of like three levels to obedience. There's, there's the have to. Man, I got to go to church. I got to read my Bible. I have to. Although I feel that. I feel like I have to now. But, but if that's where you're at, it, it, you shouldn't stay there. Another level is that I need to. Yo, I just need, we, I just need to go to church, man. You know, life's... A... And then we have the, no, I want to. I want to read your word. I want to know you, God. I want, I want your word to get in me. And literally, as I wrap, John chapter 8, Jesus says this to his disciples. He says, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you, if you hold on to my teaching, if you hold on to my teaching, you are really my disciples. And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Never let it go. Never let it go. You can hold on to God's word. You know, and something I, I, I kind of feel like happens when, when, when you get a hold of God's word is it actually is just a way of replacing what you're currently holding on to. It's, could it be that you're holding on to something God doesn't want you to hold on to? You know, a couple weeks ago, I got a phone call from somebody in the church, and he's like, yo, can I come to your house? Can you lay hands on me? I was like, bro, chill. <laughs> no, but I said, what is it? He's like, I just got a doctor's report. And it says that there's possibly a tumor. And I'm scared. And he's had this report in his hand, you know, as he's talking to me on the phone. And I'm like, let's pray. Let's replace that report in your hand for the promises of God. Because he is our ever-present help in time of need. That in my weakness, your strength is made perfect. That by your stripes, we are healed. Oh, come on, somebody. You can get a word for your season. Get a word for your year. Get a promise in you. Amen. Amen. You know, as we go into this next year, I want to challenge you. Get a word for your family. What would it look like? I'll be even so bold to say, can I submit to you? Your family needs the word of God in you. Your kids need the word of God in you. Your coworkers need the word of God in you. So may we invest in the thing that we value most. Amen. Can I get an amen in God's house? Amen. God, I thank you for your word. I pray that we would leave here with a passion and a love for your word, God. Thank you that we would be able to look back and say, how did that, how'd that even happen? How was I able to even memorize that scripture? God, I thank you that even in those moments, the Bible says that you would, you would bring to the Holy Spirit in us what to say. And God, that as we invest in your word, you would get it in us and it would produce a harvest of 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. And all of God's people said a big amen. Amen, amen and amen.